This Civic Media Podcast is sponsored by UW Organ and Tissue Donation. Organ donations are desperately needed, and now is the right time to become an organ donor. Talk to your family. Get the dot. Save lives. Go to heroicdeed.com. Show. As always, you can join us at 855-752-4842. That's 855-752-4842. Uh, good morning to you, Calvin. How you doing, man? I'm hanging in there as much as I can, Earl. How are you? I'm, I'm doing fine, man. Did you get much sleep? Yeah, I maybe slept for five-ish hours. Oh, yeah. Not particularly <sighs> restful, though. Oh man! Uh, listen, um, we uh, we are just uh, oh, it's, uh, it's Wednesday and it's after the election, and so I'm, you know, kind of melancholy. But I want to say good morning to my co-host Sandy Williams. Sandy, how you doing, sir? I'm doing all right. Like every coach uh, or ex-coach, I'm thinking about uh, lessons learned right so you, you you wake up in the morning you find out whether you won or lost uh the thing that's interesting about our elections is none of them are mandates right this was continues to be pretty razor thin uh we still have half the country on one side and half on the other so uh i just hope everyone understands that uh that it, no matter how this election went it wasn't going to be a mandate well, so we are joined by the legendary Charles Franklin uh, this morning. Good morning to you, sir. How are you? Good morning. A little sleep deprived, but I'm here. Well, you know, I tell people, you know, been around 11 different elections. And um, so we've seen the ups and downs and they don't always go your way. Uh, what really makes us unique is you know, you don't take the highs too high and the lows too low and and you can, you know, survive. So your thoughts about the outcome of the election, sir? I, I think the swing towards Trump in virtually every county in the state is notable. Um, it's not a big swing, right? He won in 2016 by about eight tenths of a point. Looks like he's going to win by about nine tenths of a point this time. Um so hardly a radical change in the outcome of the mandate you were talking about. But it is striking how consistently almost every county moved in his direction, some by a fair bit, some not by much. And in places like Waukesha, he, he won, but he won by just a little less than he did uh, that county four years ago. So Mostly, he stopped the decline in the wow counties, um, or at least the slippage was quite small. But he didn't specific, especially improve his standing in Dane and, and uh, Milwaukee. A little bit of movement, but not much there. But you look at the north and west of the state and the Green Bay area, and almost all of those counties moved in his direction by a bit, enough to flip from losing by... Uh, less than a point last time to winning by less than a point this time. So what would you attribute, what? Sandy, one, one second, what would you attribute that to considering that the Democrats almost outspent the Republicans in this state two to one? Yeah, I, I think, well, in part, money matters, but it's not everything. That's one thing that we learn out of all of this. Um, our data, our polling data all year long has shown that the economy was the top issue and Trump was seen by as better on that issue by uh, about a 10 point margin. We also see that people's family financial situation has decreased considerably throughout Trump's four years and the first year and a half of Biden. About 60% said they were living comfortably here. And that fell steadily through the Biden years 
to about 44% in the last year. It's been steady at around 44 or 45. So those kinds of economic concerns and financial concerns weigh heavily, you know, that old claim, it's the economy stupid, it comes back to us. Now, a lot of people thought abortion was important too, but about half as many as thought the economy was most important for them. Sandy? Well, I have a sense that uh, in many respects, this wasn't necessarily a vote so strongly for Donald Trump as it was a vote against uh, Democrats. And then the set that, you know, and the unease people have with the situation, whether it be the social issue that they're sensing or the financial issue, uh, which is basically blaming the incumbent for a situation which has been an ongoing trend, as you point out, uh, uh, Professor Franklin, it's been an ongoing trend since the Trump period, but the, the middle class has had an eroding uh, financial experience, which they will blame on the incumbent, clearly. Uh, and that's what happened. And remember that uh, for a lot of people, this was their first real experience with high inflation. Some of us go back to the high inflation of the early 80s. But if you're under about 50 years old, you were not an adult in a previous high inflationary period. So I think it took an extra punch there because people had so little experience with dealing with it. Well, and again, this was blaming the incumbent because, you know, when you get into causation, the causation is much more complex than yes. the incumbent. I, I do think that democratic messaging has been very poor. I think to the extent that they have a platform that's premised on a variety of issues, they didn't do a good job of explaining to this, this eroding middle class that they were empathetic with their situation, understood the situation, and were ready to take steps to respond to it. I mean, the, the nomenclature they used for their legislation, Inflation Reduction Act and the rest of it, had nothing really to do with the middle class understanding what might be in those parcels of legislation that would be re was reactive to them. Right. I, th I think the Democrats have, have, have a lesson to learn here, which has to do with, um, and part of it is messaging and part of it is policy, but their, their capacity to message to the people who voted against them this time clearly was deficient. Do you think, tell, tell me this, do you think that it's that the lack of a demo democratic primary and the selection process for their candidate ended up having a being a big factor. I mean, I I think that she ended up being a good candidate, but uh, the process obviously uh, didn't expose people to uh, a bunch of policy discussion. That's right. I think, and I agree with what you said earlier about messaging too. Um, I think the Harris campaign ran a decent set of messages, and certainly they focused on things that would help the middle class, but it's kind of too little too late uh, to change the image. I think if we step back a little bit, Joe Biden's job approval was pretty high in the summer of 2021, but it rapidly fell to the low 40s and has stayed in the low 40s ever since. It was an administration and a president who was sort of uniquely unable to sell his accomplishments. Those legislative achievements like the Inflation Reduction Act that you mentioned were major legislative achievements, but it was a White House that found no way to make the public aware of them, let alone give credit to Biden for that. Um, and then it was just too late for Harris to step in at the last minute and change those perceptions. Um, I think if you could imagine an alternate reality in which Biden, after the 22 election, claimed credit for doing better than expected and said, and now I will announce I'll be a one-time president and hand it over to the next generation, you could imagine a very different process where we would have had a fully competitive uh, Democratic primary. Now, there's no telling who would have won that or whether they would have done any better than Harris. But there's no question the late switch um, and that Harris necessarily is burdened as the vice president of an unpopular president uh, was a big barrier to overcome. Uh, uh, and I do think immigration and the economy played a big role there. And abortion just wasn't enough to overcome that. I also well, think, well, that I Sandy, hold on. I also think there were more factors 
uh, that we may not be willing to even have discussions about uh, where people were able to rally around Donald Trump, uh, you know, tribalism and other things that came into play that I don't even know if Donald Trump, that that God himself almighty could have changed uh, the, the messaging that Donald Trump uh, issued. And, and so there were people who rallied to that. Uh, how much of that do you think uh, factored into this? Uh, is that for me or for Sandy? No, for Sorry. you. For you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I look, we found consistently that people thought the personal characteristics were better for Harris than they were for Trump. By a lot, people said Harris had the better temperament to be president. She was more honest. She was intelligent uh, compared to Trump. Uh, Trump's advantage was only, but maybe significantly, on having had significant accomplishments when he was president. People still gave him a lot of credit for that. And they also overlooked the perception of over 60 percent that said he'd behaved corruptly. So if this were on purely candidate image, Harris should have won this. But on issues, Trump had the advantage pretty consistently. Uh, in fact, on the issue that the voter thought was most important to them, Trump was seen as better by 46 percent to 43 percent for Harris. And so, you know, in the end, it could have been personality, but it ended up not being and there is certainly a, a large segment of the American public that is very devoted to Donald Trump. And sometimes in our interviews, they'll say, oh, I wish he didn't talk the way he does or other kinds of complaints. But that doesn't stick with them. They then go ahead and vote for him anyway. So they're overlooking those things because of other things they like about him. I also have a sense that some of the social issues, uh, the, the focus on transgenderism and the things that were distractive, really. I mean, they were problems that were maybe marginalized communities that needed to be supported. But the, but the, the Democrats le leapt in up to their hips on the issue and the Republicans took advantage of it. And I'm afraid that those issues might have played a bigger role than people were willing to talk about when they talked to you, Doug. So no, I think that's a good point. So so let me ask you: Do you have another segment in you, or uh, you've been up all night? No, I'm willing to stick around. All right, so this is fun. So we've got we've got Professor Charles Franklin, uh, who is on the line. My co-host Sandy Williams and you, eight five five seven five two forty eight forty two. You're tuned into a special edition of the Earl Ingram Show. You're listening to Civic Media. Stay up to date on the latest news and information for your local community and Wisconsin by signing up for our free email newsletter. Visit civicmedia.us slash email to get started. Back to a very special edition of the Earl Ingram Show. As always, you can join us at 855-752-4842. I'm joined, uh, Sandy uh, Williams has uh, agreed to join us this entire week, my co-host. And so we are joined by Professor Charles Franklin as we kind of, you know, go over what transpired on yesterday. Sandy, I think there was something you were saying before uh, we had to go to break. 
Well, we, I was just saying that, you know, Donald Trump has this loyal group. I don't know how many millions it is, but it's tens of millions who follow him, who follow his brand. And I think there is some process and maybe the maybe the professor has done it with polling to try and figure out what elements of the brand, the Trump brand it is that allow people to be so enthusiastically supportive of someone who they find to be faulted. You know, they, they, they have to make apologies for him, but they don't abandon him. And I, my sense is that a part of this is the anti-elite kind of a movement, the anti-elite, which includes uh, this woke, the, the whole woke issue, and th that it's been a, a major distraction for the Democrats, uh, taking away from real policy to talk about sort of fictitious policy issues. Yeah. No, I, I would mostly support that. I think that um, in terms of the messaging that Democrats have done and the policy focus that they've done, um, I think it has a strong influence of upper middle class, highly educated values. And that's an important part of the country. But we should remember that only about 35 to 38 percent of the country has a college degree. A little over 60 percent lack a college degree. And in the old days, you know, if you ask people what they liked about the Democratic Party, they said they're for the working man. <laughs> man, notice the dated terminology there. But that was such an overwhelming image of the party from the 30s through the 70s, 80s and so on. But it has shifted pretty dramatically in the modern era. And Trump has had a big role in doing that by attacking elites, attacking economically advantaged people, something amusing coming from a billionaire, but it's still been a powerful message for the now going on eight, nine years that Trump has been in intimately involved in American politics. You know, I'm one of those blue collar workers. I'm one of those people without a college degree. And so when I hear people talking about the elites and that the elites are basically a, a more on the Democratic side of things, I see many elites in the Republican Party as well. And yes. and so and so when when I hear that the Democrats are the ones who are, you know, the elites are they've been they've done a great job of sending that message out to people uh, who live in rural areas. And I would say to those people today, if I could talk to them, what do you think Donald Trump is going to do to change your reality? He was there for four years and he didn't deliver on the things that he promised you. Yes, uh, when you ask the question whether or not people were in a better uh, shape financially then than they were today, that would be yes, because they weren't going, living through the inflationary uh, years that, that started with Donald Trump and, and wound up ending with, with Joe Biden and also the fact that the Democrats weren't able to really educate uh, that populace that it was a global inflation and that, and that our nation did better handling it than the rest of the world. I, I, I have a sense that this elite thing, though, has a lot to do with educational institutions and the, and the image of ivory towers. And I have a sense that the, that the unrest on campuses that occurred this last year was a red flag reminder to the populist uh, kind of gut reaction that it was reacting against that and, and paints the Democrats as being the people who inhabit those places. I don't know. I, this is my intuition, doctor. You, yeah. you do polling. Do you think that's correct? Well, you know, James Carville, the <clears throat> Democratic campaign consultant, uh, major figure in the Clinton administration, says the problem with the Democratic Party is it sounds like a conversation in a faculty lounge. And I think that's an exaggeration, but there's certainly a real core of truth to that, that many of the concerns that uh, Democrats have, especially Democratic activists, are on the cutting edge of social issues in a way that most of the country hasn't come to. If we look a little bit at history, think about the change in opinion about gay rights and same-sex marriage. Uh, it moved pretty fast in favor of same-sex marriage, but it still took 20 years for that to go from being supported by only 20% of the public to 60% of the public. So when you're on the cutting edge of social issues, 
takes a while to bring the public along if you can even succeed in that. The record is that it can succeed, but you shouldn't overestimate how long and slow a process it is. So, so Professor, the healing aspects of this, <clears throat> there has to be a healing. Um, how do you begin to, uh, and where do you begin in that process? Well, I'm not very sanguine about that happening very fast. I think it's a Generation. difficult process. <laughs> I think uh, the Trump administration coming up the next four years will be the time for the Republicans to decide what the future of their party looks like in 2028 and beyond. And I think at least as importantly, a time for Democrats to decide how can they oppose Donald Trump over these next four years and establish a new image of the party that can be more successful when we come to the 28 presidential campaign, and for that matter, the 26 midterms. Professor Franklin, get some rest. It is a pleasure and an honor to have you on. We'll be certainly reaching out to you in the future. Thanks so much for having me. All right. Uh, special, very special election edition of the Earl Ingram Show with my co-host Sandy Williams. Our phone lines are open at 855-752-4842. Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts on yesterday's outcome. You're tuned into a very special edition of the Earl Ingram Show. So tell me, please, can we fix our nation's broken heart? Can we fix our nation's broken heart? You're an organ donor, right? Well, here's a tragic fact. Approximately 20 people die each day waiting for precious donated organs. You could make a life-saving decision simply by getting that important dot on your driver's license. That little dot shows those who need to know that you've made a decision to donate organs at a critical time. Go to HeroicDeed.com to learn more about the importance of organ donation and how you can make your wishes known. Talk to your family. Get the dot. Save lives. HeroicDeed.com We are one love, one race We all come from the same place We all live in this world together It doesn't matter who's right It doesn't matter who's wrong If we don't know All right, welcome back to a very special edition of the Earl Ingram Show As always, you can join us at 855-752-4842 That's 855-752-4842 uh, And my co-host Sandy Williams uh, is with us our phone lines are open, and we'd love to hear your thoughts. You know, Sandy. Um, I well, the just... music, first of all, is, is that we're going to continue on this uh, unity thing. And I thought that uh, Stevie Wonder's anthem that he just finished writing was pretty fitting. And, and I think the rest of the music today is is fitting as well. You know, regardless of the outcome, we're in this together. Well, and, and I would say, um, you know, there'll be no crack at our tears. Uh, this morning on the Earl Ingram show, nor would there be any crack it out tears from this time forward. You pick yourself up, you dust yourself off, and you keep moving forward. Um, it's a presidential election. This too shall pass, and uh, and that's the only way you survive in uh, in a nation that's not always and things don't always go according to plan. So that's how you handle these kinds of things. Well, I think the best thing we can do is read the message within the results, right? It's the it's the lessons learned, but there's messages within there to be listened to, to be thought about, to be absorbed by people in politics on both sides of the aisle. Uh, you know, the, the, how the next four years unfolds is going to be very important to us. Uh, and then how the four years after that unfolds will continue to be very important to us. We all have grandchildren we need to be thinking about. You know, Sandy, I will say that part of this uh, and what's so frustrating is that we, we have come to accept a person, people not being truthful. 
if we want to learn some lessons about this past election, people have accepted people not being truthful. And and regardless of, I think, what your beliefs are, when you compromise the truth, uh, for whatever your, your reasons are, uh, you have done some major damage to uh, to this nation and to young people and even to yourself. Uh, let's be clear. What Donald Trump and the Republicans presented uh, nonstop during this election is nothing to be celebrated. They went to the depths of hell in some of the things that they put out there. And I don't know how you can feel good about that. I don't know how you can feel good about saying, I don't like the guy, but I love his policies. I don't know. I vote on character. If, if I think your character is not what I think it should be, I can't support you. But apparently that's not a criteria for uh, half of this nation. And, and I think that that needs to be said. I don't think that that needs to be whitewashed or covered over. People have accepted well, that. And, and nor do I think that we shouldn't stop exploring how we get back to the truth and how we get back to facts. Uh, you know, social media echo chambers have, have done a lot of damage to our society generally, not just, politica, not just politically, but to our societal relationships and, and how our society is operating and what has happened to our society. And, and, we, and we need to wake up that we have more to work on than just politics. We have to begin to work on the, the infrastructure of our society to get it back to uh, sort of an operational level that doesn't take us careening down uh, blind alleys and, and bad roads. Uh, facts are important. And any business knows that if they start operating in a fictional world, they'll go out of business quite quickly. Uh, so our phone lines are open, 855 752 Forty-eight, forty-two, Calvin. I can't see. A, is there anyone on the line? Yes, uh, we have Gary from Sussex online. Good morning to you, Gary. Uh, you say what? Girl. Yes. Yeah. Hi. All right. You know, um, I think part of the problem that the Democrats, when they went after Trump with, with the DOJ and that all that stuff, and then calling him a Nazi and, and, and the rallies are a bunch of Nazi people at the rally out in, the, uh, in New York and stuff like that. People take that personally. And I think that they just get mad. And, you know, another thing I, I always said that you can't win an election because you hate the other person that bad. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, the stock market is up. 1300 points this morning. So the stock market is, is saying that the economy is going to be good. I, I think, and like I ended yesterday, whatever, whoever wins or loses, we just got to work together as a, uh, you know, people, citizens, we got to make, we got to make, we got to show the world that we we're, we're, we're together. Otherwise it's going to be a, a real problem. So, so, not have another so, so Gary, let me ask you, as people say that the stock market is up 1300, you know, by the time Donald Trump comes into office, the first day he's in office, the stock market could drop 3,000 points. So if if you think that because Donald Trump was elected that, you know, it raising 1,300 uh, points is is going to remain that way because it's Donald Trump, then, you know, I, you know, I think that's kind of foolhardy to believe that that's how the market works. But the other thing I would say to you is when you talk about how people felt uh, about the way Donald Trump was treated. Uh, the other side of the American people think that Donald Trump was treated in the manner that a man should be treated commensurate with the crimes that he committed. And so I don't think that because Donald Trump won, that it means that, you know, the American people now have exonerated him uh, and because he won. He, he clearly has committed some crimes and whether, whether or not he's elected as president of the United States uh, shouldn't change that. Sandy, you want to respond to that? Well, I'm, I'm interested in the concrete details of what it is that Donald Trump might be doing. And I, I, for one, am someone who did read all of Project 2025. 
And I am very concerned about elements of Project 2025. I, I think the FBI director should not serve at the pleasure of the president. Uh, I think that that will definitely be something that we'll watch and, and watch over and see whether, whether there's an effort to try and establish that. I don't think the Department of Justice should, should work at the beck and call of the president all the way out through the U.S. attorney's offices around the country. Uh, I don't think that the military ought to be used in the United States for purposes that uh, involve American citizens. These are all fundamental issues that are significantly important. And the fact that, uh, that Trump is now elected does not mean that I, that I, for one, am not going to be vigilantly watching to make sure that something about our system uh, as fundamental as some of those issues uh, don't get spoiled. You know, whether someone who wants to do all that is a Nazi or not, someone who would, who would try to do that is someone who ought to be watched over closely by the, ele by the other uh, elements of our government, the Supreme Court and the legislature you know, and the citizenry. You know, Sandy, you and I talked about this, and our phone lines open again at 855-752-4842. Very special edition of the Earl Ingram Show with my co-host, Sandy Williams. Sandy, we talked about, you and I, what's going to happen. Donald Trump has made a lot of promises um, that he's going to attempt to keep, maybe. But one of them, for sure, is Ukraine and the fact that after all this investment by our nation in, in Ukraine and the Ukrainian-Russian war, Donald Trump is going to bring that to an end. Uh, Ukraine is not going to receive additional funding under President Trump. Is it, is it kind of safe to, to think that? Well, he doesn't actually control the funding that's controlled by Congress, and Congress has already authorized a bunch of funds. He could well have a control on the rate of the spigot uh, in terms of how that fund, fund gets uh, dispersed. Um, but, you know, Donald Trump has time on his side. He's going to be president for the next four years, uh, God willing. And he uh, and during those four years, there's no question that there will be come a peace in Ukraine, that the Ukrainian war, I can't believe there's any potential that it would last another four years. The war in Gaza will come to an, the war in uh, the Palestinian problem will somehow be resolved in the next four years. And that would have happened uh, under Kamala Harris as well. So that, you know, there is a likelihood that, that the peace will be achieved in those places. How quickly and whether it's actually the result of a foreign policy initiated by Donald Trump is yet to be seen. Um, so, but, you know, the president does have a fair amount of power unilaterally in the areas of foreign affairs and tariffs. And these are two things that Donald Trump has promised to be active in. So, Calvin, do we have anybody else on the line? Yeah, let's go to Mike from Kenosha. Hey, good morning to you, Mike. Uh, your thoughts, sir? All right. Um, I, we, we don't have Mike. Um, let, let's say this. Um, I will, Sandy, the next thing. Donald Trump talked about the fact that he is going to apply all these tariffs, right? And so he's going to change the economy uh, because he's going to place all these tremendous tariffs on uh, all of the goods that come into this nation. How much of that is truth and how much of that is fiction? Well, we have to find out. I mean, you know, I worry that Donald Trump doesn't understand tariffs. Uh, my hope is that he will have around him uh, people who do, uh, that he will have some good advice. Last time he had Peter Navarro, who has always been known as a tariff hawk, uh, and maybe wouldn't provide him with the kind of advice he needs. Uh, but across the board, tariffs promise to do a great deal of damage to our economy and lots of uh, the financial community understands that and worries about that. And the question now is whether he will do it. You know, we, Senator Ron Johnson was making apologies for that policy and saying, well, that's not going to happen. So, you know, uh, it's just uh, his economic policies were all over the map. And which, if any of them, he attempts to implement, I think we can be quite confident that his tax reductions are something that will get pursued because the Republican Party seems to be married to tax reductions. Um, he will have to get things that need to go through Congress through the filibuster process, uh, the cloture vote uh, 
process in the Senate unless the Republican majority decides to back off from that. Um, so I, I worry about the tariff policy because I think it could have the potential to do great damage to the economy. So let's see if we've got our phone lines uh, repaired. Calvin, is do we have our phone lines repaired? Yeah, uh, we should be all set. Let's go to Tom from L.A. Good morning to you, Tom. You say what? Hello, Earl? Yes. Okay. Um, first off, uh, we the people ultimately are the government. Um, we need to get complete money out of politics. Um, I would like to congratulate the people on the um, the right, um, what I call the wrong, I guess, wrong side of the aisle. Um, I'm a competitor. We competed hard and uh, we lost. And that's not easy for me to say today, but I want to congratulate them. Um, I really do think that the American people do vote against their best interests. You guys were talking before about, I don't know, this elitist craziness or whatever it is that you guys were talking about. Um, there's so much more to this than that. This is, this is now become like Animal Farm. This is going to become like the Blues Brothers having a big, you know, party. I, I, it, it just does not seem like they're going to have the most competent people and we the people government, and that does scare me. Um, I am also scared for my own safety. Um, luckily, I live in California, but for any LGBTQ plus person out there, um, they won on this whole thing with the uh, transgender thing. That's all they had in their commercials, transgender, transgender, transgender. And it really is quite the joke. All right, all right Tom, thank you very much for the call. 855 75 to 4842 is the number. It's very special uh, after election edition of the Earl Ingram Show with my co-host Sandy Williams and you. You're listening to Civic Media. Find the latest news, information, and archives of all your favorite shows on the Civic Media website, civicmedia.us. I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them blue for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. All right, welcome back to a very special after election edition of the Earl Ingram Show. As always, you can join us at 855 752 4842. That's 855 752 4842. My co host Sandy Williams has joined us. Let's go right back to the phone lines. Let's go to Mike from Kenosha. Thank you very much, Mike. You say what? Hey, good morning. Thanks for uh, taking my call as always. Uh, um, I'm not quite as conciliatory this morning. Um, and the reason being is I think there's three major culprits. And first part of it is it, the Dems did not show up. Uh, the, the American people did not show up. And when you don't show up, uh, you get to suffer the consequences sometimes. But more importantly, you know, uh, it, it, this is going back to truth to power in, in the truth, if you will. When uh, January 6th, four years later, you know, three and three quarters years later, uh, they can still uh, uh, dispute um, what our, our eyes and our ears uh, saw and heard um, when they can use that as misinformation um, in the Justice Department and Merrick Garland uh, takes a four-year hiatus uh, from you know, delving into January 6th, this should be settled. This should have been settled, uh, many of these issues. But let's talk about January 6th. That should have been settled that spring. And here... Uh, 
it's being used as a weapon in our elections four years later to, to, to just confuse everybody. So, no, no, I'm not I'm not into this conciliatory mood. I think uh, the judges put their, their thumbs on the scale. Uh, we have documents, cases, and other cases where uh, we have uh, a complete in administration that denied the subpoenas. They wouldn't testify, uh, and yet uh, many of them weren't jailed or held accountable. No, 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 no. Uh, what we have learned here is our system, we have allowed it to grow warts. Uh, our infrastructure for, for democracy and those infrastructure things are unity. They are trust. Um, they have been whittled away, primarily uh, because the media doesn't do their job. They continue to, to allow these falsehoods to go on and on. And when falsehoods are not confronted, they grow, and they create their own reality. And, and when they create their own reality, it's very, very difficult to change the minds later. So, hey, hey, hey no, Mike, I'm not Mike, Mike, I wish I had more time. Thank you very much for the call. Let's go to Paul from Spooner. Good morning to you, Paul. You say what? Paul from Spooner. Mentions Donald. Men, Project 2025 mentions Donald Trump's name over 300 times. We know what the plan is. He's also talking, I believe Trump is talking about. I'm concerned about, I don't know, once again, I'm confused. My thoughts are really rambling, but we can sit and say, we also know that Donald Trump is making threats and he doesn't have the boundaries to hold them together like we did before. He's got a Supreme Court that's given him free run now. He can do whatever he wants. He's talking about the insurrectionists getting him out of prison. He's also talking about using the military to go after people, citizens, but I believe that the military might back up. But I believe that he's got a private army that's going to be coming out that'll do his dirty work for him. Just like any other mob boss, it's all done with winks and nods, and it'll get done. So I do feel much less safe today than we did before, and I trust J.D. Vance less. So. Hey, Paul, thank you very much for the call. Let's go to uh, Cindy from Appleton. Good morning to you, Cindy. Your thoughts? Well, Earl, I think this is going to be turning out to be one of the darkest days in the history of the United States. I cannot believe that people have put this man back in power. I thought that this country wanted to fix the divisiveness. I wanted, thought this country wanted to heal. I thought this country wanted a president that was going to do for the people, not just for the rich. We are in such dire straits here. I am along with your last caller. I am not in any kind of conciliatory mood. As a matter of fact, I am freaking terrified today. We are in big doo-doo, and I wish people that would have voted for this man could have understood this beforehand. Uh, Cindy, thank you very much for the call. Sandy, you want to respond to any of that? Well, I do. I, th I think, Mike, uh, in terms of his discussion of the social infrastructure, that's what I was referring to. Our social infrastructure, which includes uh, a grip on truth and a requirement of truth, uh, it, it includes uh, fact sourcing uh, and fact sources uh, that we've lost and, and our dependency and our requirement that people speak the truth has seem, seems to have been lost. And we've exposed the fact that our um, that the American processes rely on people uh, keeping uh, and operating within norms and that the laws themselves aren't enough of a guardrail because laws take a long time to enforce and our courts aren't a reliable place for enforcing laws. So, you know, I am worried about the fact that the, that the American processes, the norms have been tested, the norms have uh, been have been ignored, and when the when the norms are ignored, we're, we're left with a system which is uh, more vulnerable than I think we thought. And I think this this election uh, exposes those vulnerabilities. And and my hope is that that. Uh, that we move on from it in a in a in a, in a manner that and it corrects them. Uh, all right, eight five 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 two forty eight forty two. Very special after election edition of the Earl Ingram Show. My co-host Sandy Williams are going to be joined uh, next by Dr. Robert Craig, Executive Director of Citizen Action, and you on the Earl Ingram Show.
the national news cycle never stops. But it can be hard to find news about your local community. Civic Media is dedicated to providing quality local and state news coverage across Wisconsin. With the Civic Media app, you can get notifications about local stories that matter to you and your community. Find the free Civic Media app in your phone's app store and choose notifications from the menu to tell us what kind of news you want to hear about.